Hi, I'm Amna Khalid, Associate Professor of History at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. And I'm Jeff Snyder, Associate Professor in Educational Studies at Carleton. Our political leanings? We're both left of center. About eight or nine years ago, some of our students started asking for trigger warnings. At first, accommodating their requests seemed like the reasonable thing to do. If trigger warnings really minimized emotional distress while maximizing learning opportunities, why wouldn't we use them? Since then, we've changed our minds. The crux is two discoveries we've made. First, new research shows that trigger warnings do not improve students' mental health. And second, we are convinced they push both students and faculty to avoid important topics that are perceived as too distressing. Let's start with some definitions. A trigger warning is a statement cautioning that content, as in a text, video, or class, may be disturbing or upsetting. A trigger warning is not the same thing as a general content advisory, like the explicit content label for music albums. Trigger warnings identify specific content and themes. Here's a real example for Toni Morrison's debut novel, The Bluest Eye. Where do trigger warnings come from? The story begins in the 1970s when the term post-traumatic stress disorder emerged to describe symptoms that some Vietnam vets were experiencing. PTSD was formally recognized as a disorder in the 1980 edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Symptoms of PTSD include flashbacks, nightmares, intrusive thoughts, and social withdrawal. The term trigger then referred to any stimulus that set off a post-traumatic stress reaction. Anything can be a trigger, from particular sights, sounds, and smells, to certain foods, faces, and calendar dates. In the early 2000s, feminist blogs started using trigger warnings to alert survivors of sexual assault to content about sexual violence. Trigger warnings started to pop up on college campuses around 2013. Those in favor said they would empower students suffering from trauma to delve into difficult material by giving them the chance to prepare and manage their reactions. A 2016 survey by National Public Radio found that about half of the 800 college instructors surveyed had used trigger warnings. But do they even work? When debates about trigger warnings first erupted, there was little to no research on this question. Luckily, today there is. As far as we know, there's not a single experimental study that has found significant benefits. To the contrary, the consensus so far, based on 17 studies, is that trigger warnings do not alleviate emotional distress. They do not significantly reduce negative affect or minimize intrusive thoughts, two hallmarks of PTSD. Note that these findings hold for individuals with and without a history of trauma. A recent study by Harvard psychologists that focused on trauma survivors found that trigger warnings were not helpful even when they warned about content that closely matched survivors' traumas. What's more, they found that trigger warnings actually increased anxiety for people with the most severe PTSD. They started viewing trauma as central to their life narrative. The study concluded that trigger warnings may be most harmful to the very individuals they were designed to protect. An estimated 3.5% of the U.S. population has PTSD. Note that the overwhelming majority of people who experience trauma do not actually develop PTSD. For the small proportion of our students suffering from PTSD, colleges and universities have an obligation to help them succeed academically. That means access to high-quality therapy, not trigger warnings. The application of a triggering trauma model to classroom instruction has been detrimental to learning and teaching. On campus, what constitutes a trigger has expanded dramatically. It's no longer stimuli that induce symptoms of PTSD, but any material that might elicit difficult emotional responses. Anyone is susceptible to being triggered. To see what happens when triggers were untethered from PTSD, just look at Oberlin College's original policy. With a new emphasis on social justice, topics that supposedly necessitated trigger warnings included racism, classism, sexism, cissexism, ableism, and other issues of privilege and oppression. 
Some of the first books slapped with trigger warnings across the country were The Merchant of Venice for anti-Semitism, The Great Gatsby for misogyny, and Things Fall Apart for colonization, domestic abuse, and murder, among other things. Here's the problem. Trigger warnings impinge on academic freedom, especially when it comes to teaching sensitive and controversial topics. As early as 2014, Harvard Law professor Jeannie Suit Gerson reported that about a dozen of her colleagues had dropped rape law from their criminal law courses because students were complaining the material was triggering. Consider the consequences. Not only will students not learn the material, but there will be fewer lawyers with the expertise to fight for rape victims. Since then, the fear that some material is just too hot to handle has only intensified. Books, articles, and films are quietly being dropped, along with lectures, discussion activities, and assignments. Beyond self-censorship, the trigger warning framework has opened the door for students to opt out of assignments and classes. Many supporters of trigger warnings are in favor of providing students with alternative readings. Some have even suggested that less graphic textbooks should be made available. In a recent article in Inside Higher Ed, a professor of journalism makes the case for detailed trigger warnings on syllabi. But he doesn't stop just there. He asks professors to follow his lead and add this note. You don't have to attend class if the content elicits an uncomfortable emotional response. His list of potentially triggering topics that justify missing class include Nazi symbols, alcohol, profanity and slurs, even the Emancipation Proclamation. This approach has many problems. It promotes the idea that students are inherently fragile, encourages them to be hyper-vigilant about any content that might cause discomfort, and it waters down meaningful engagement with difficult topics. We were gobsmacked several years ago when a colleague informed us that a student had requested a trigger warning for a reading about the Holocaust. The same student also asked for an alternative text because the original reading was too disturbing. Two quick observations. First, if you read about the Holocaust and are not disturbed, you should really look into the possibility that you're a sociopath. Second, there is no alternative to learning about the Holocaust. It's a unique, world-shaking event for which there is no substitute. At the college level, the Holocaust, slavery, genocide, and other harrowing topics shouldn't come in two different versions, regular and light. Which topics even merit trigger warnings to begin with? Suicide, sexual assault, and eating disorders typically make the cut. Warfare, cancer, and starving children do not. Ask yourself. Do you have the expertise or moral authority to decide whose pain matters most? The use of trigger warnings only makes sense if you believe that teaching follows a predetermined script. But when a classroom conversation is in full swing, it's impossible to predict the direction it will take. Every contribution is a potential trigger. Why are we so afraid to acknowledge the power of academic study to provoke, destabilize, and disturb Conflict, pain, and suffering are central elements of any serious study of the human experience. In U.S. history courses, for example, you can't present an accurate portrait of past events without covering horrifying material, from the genocide of Native peoples to the tragedy of 9-11. If we truly want to understand and reckon with past and present atrocities, we must be willing to face difficult, even excruciating moments. To be clear, we are not in favor of a shock and awe approach of springing distressing content on students. To the contrary, we believe that effective teaching practices naturally address many of the issues that trigger warnings are meant to tackle. The syllabus is key. Clear course descriptions and straightforward lists of topics are essential. Context, too, is crucial. For instance, there are dozens of trigger warnings that could precede a screening of Spike Lee's film Do the Right Thing, from racial slurs to alcohol addiction. But that reduces a complex work of art to a litany of problematic aspects, not to mention eliminating the element of surprise that can shock us into a higher consciousness. When I show Do the Right Thing, I invite students to share what they know about Spike Lee films before they watch it. This ensures that everyone is aware intense examinations of race and racism are likely to figure. 
Do the Right Thing in particular, I note, is about a volatile, multi-ethnic Brooklyn neighborhood in the late 1980s. This little bit of background knowledge prepares students to fully engage with the film without giving away plot points, identifying key themes, or telling them how to interpret particular scenes. To recap, trigger warnings do not minimize anxiety and emotional distress. They also contribute to a misguided safety and security model of education, which deprives students of the most powerful learning opportunities. Simply using the phrase trigger warning raises the stakes, squeezing course content into a narrow frame defined by trauma and suffering. They do more harm than good. And that's why we don't use them.